Hey everyone, uh, we have the honor and pleasure of having Jeff Winner with us. Um, <laughs> hey, I know you. Right from the beginning. Um, you guys all know Jeff as the CEO of LinkedIn. Under his leadership, the company went through amazing hyper growth from 33 million members to north of half a billion members today, uh, from $78 million in revenue to several billions of dollars in revenue today. And I think most importantly, and I think Jeff will agree, we are well on our way to operate our vision, which is to create economic opportunity for every professional in the workforce. Also a personal moment for me, Jeff has been my mentor and coach for several years. I can easily attribute a big part of my personal growth to uh, working, being mentored by Jeff. Uh, so I'm grateful for his time today and for the ability for you guys to kind of get some of those insights and wisdom. I thought I'll kick this off with um, what is always a hot, debatable topic in the Valley which is founder CEO to new CEO transition. Uh, obviously been in the news recently with Uber, with Travis moving on to, to Dara, and you and Reed had a phenomenal transition. There's no other way to describe it. It's just been kind of hyper growth since then, and you guys also have a great relationship. It's very empowering to see you guys together, uh, and it feels in many ways somebody, something that people would uh, kind of aspire for. And I was kind of wondering uh, if Travis and Dara would kind of ask you guys to, for dinner and they'll ask for the playbook. Like that, how that would, would make they, for an interesting that would be, night out. Very different people. The four of us. Uh, that's where the resemblance ends. But um, if they'll basically ask you guys for, like, can you codify the transition? What went well? Hmm. And in retrospect, are there any things you would have done differently? Uh, well, first of all, uh, let me start by thanking all of you for being here today and for having me. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with all of you. and. Uh, it's a great opportunity to spend time with uh, Tomer on stage like this, and uh, I appreciate the kind words, and I would say the same back to Tomer. He embodies everything that makes LinkedIn what it is today, and it's wonderful to have you on the team, and thank you for doing this. So in terms of the uh, transition, the handoff from uh, founding CEO to professional CEO, and advice we would give Dara and Travis, and uh, whether or not you could codify the way we did it. I think there are most definitely things that uh, are extensible to other teams and other companies who are going through similar situations. So for starters, uh, Reed and I didn't do a traditional interview process. Uh, Reed, for those who know him, uh, Adam knows him quite well. He hired Adam into LinkedIn. Uh, Reed is one of the most thoughtful human beings I've ever met. So typically when people hear thoughtful, they think of considerate, and they think of generous and loyal and all those superlatives, and he's all of those things. But I also mean it uh, in the dictionary sense of the word. He thinks a lot. And he has frameworks and approaches for just about anything you could possibly conceive of. And sometimes you'll find yourself kind of testing him to see whether or not he's got a framework for a little bit of esoterica, and he'll surprise you every time. He's, he's just a really interesting person to be around, incredibly bright. So at any rate, uh, he gave a lot of thought to this transition. Prior to my joining, Reed had hired another professional CEO and a great guy named Dan Nye. Uh, and the two of them had a lot of mutual respect and admiration for one another. Dan's a very talented uh, individual. But it didn't work out in part because <laughs> Reed was the uh, founder of LinkedIn, the largest shareholder and the CEO, when he handed off the baton to Dan. He hired him as the CEO. And then Reed took on the title of president of product. And as president of product, he reported to Dan as the CEO, who in turn reported to Reed as the chairman of the board <laughs> and the largest shareholder. So what could possibly go wrong with that configuration? So Reed learned from that when I was hired, decided to do things differently. One of the first things he did differently by virtue of that experience and being so thoughtful, uh, no singular interview. By some measures, uh, I've heard Reed uh, summarize the time we spent together as roughly 30 plus hours. I don't know if it was that many, but uh, we spent a lot of time together just talking. Everything? Uh, just talking through everything, getting to know one another better. Reed and I had actually met. I was hired uh, in, the, in the fall, early winter of uh, 2008. I started uh, in December of 2008, but Reed and I met in February of 2008. We actually, I know exactly where we were. We were in the basement of a restaurant called Boulevard in San Francisco, and we were there brainstorming ideas for an event, oddly enough, called Brainstorm, which was put on by Fortune. And uh, I remember being struck by uh, Reed's insight as we were going around the table. And we had mutual friends who suggested we should get to know one another. And we had met a few times. But when we started to roll up our sleeves and think through this process, we just spent a lot of time thinking about the business, 
uh, getting to know how we would approach certain problems, uh, what we've learned from our prior experiences. Uh, some of it was professionally oriented, some of it was uh, just kind of getting to know one another. But that, that's the first thing I would tell people in that situation, is you got to build a relationship before you start. And I think all too often people are going through a traditional interview process, they're passing muster, and then they start. And if you're going to make it work between a professional CEO and a founder, you have to have a real relationship. Uh, a second thing that I've been alluding to this entire time is that uh, I have a lot of respect, a tremendous amount of respect for Eden. I, I just I like Reed a lot. Uh, he's not only been uh, a partner in terms of building and scaling LinkedIn, uh, he's been a friend, he's been a mentor, he's become a very close family friend. Uh, the kids will refer to him as Uncle Reed. And that kind of relationship and respect and admiration in part led to me joining LinkedIn. I joined LinkedIn uh, because of Reed, in part, not in spite of Reed. All too often you hear stories of the professional CEO who's brought in, the business may be distressed, and they can't get rid of the legacy fast enough. They can't get rid of the prior CEO or the founder or whatever that founder brought to the table. But a big part of my joining LinkedIn was predicated on Reed sticking around and trying to figure out the right role for him. The third thing and the, the insight that I think most people uh, don't necessarily consider. So uh, the night before I started, I called Reed and I said, okay, I'm going to be joining and we, one thing we haven't discussed explicitly is who's going to be responsible for what. I was joining, by the way, as an interim president. I would have the role of CEO, but I wasn't sure I wanted to do this full time. I had just left Yahoo. Yahoo had been a lot of ups and a lot of downs. And I didn't know if I was burnt out on Yahoo or burnt out on operations, but I was very passionate about LinkedIn, the opportunity to work with Reed. So I agreed to join as interim president as long as Reed said I was open to being a full-time CEO. And I said, I'll do that as long as he's open to me being a full-time CEO. Night before I joined, I said, in light of the fact I'm going to be interim president, you're going to uh, be the CEO still in title until we're ready to do this permanently. Uh, let's talk about decision making. What decisions do you want to make? What decisions do you want me to make? And he said, well, that's easy. It's your ball. You run with it. <laughs> I, was, I was a bit dumbfounded. I said, excuse me? And he said, yeah, I, I just went through all of this. I'm not doing this again. I'm not making the same mistakes I just made. You're going to make the decisions. And if I can help you in any way, you'll let me know. So he took it a step further. And when I first started, Reed scheduled over the first eight to 10 weeks, we, Reed was out of the office for about six to eight weeks. On purpose. Oh, yeah, very much so. So he recognized that no matter what we explain to people in terms of who was responsible for what, that people reflexively were going to go back to Reed when they needed a decision made. Or if they disagreed with me, the new guy, they'd go to Reed. So he took himself physically out of the equation so I could build that connective tissue with people. So that's, those are all examples of how thoughtful he is. That's amazing. When you think about things you would have done differently, anything comes to mind? Not with regard to the transition between the two of us, and I know that sounds a little Pollyanna. Uh, I'm not glossing over stuff, and I'm not trying to spare the gory details. It just, I'm not sure it could have gone any better. By the way, I've been spending my time talking about the relationship between Reed and I. Dan Nye could not have handled things any better than he did. Uh, he was uh, extraordinarily gracious, super high integrity guy, and all too often the person you're replacing in a situation like that may be angry about the way things unfolded and they either explicitly or implicitly will poison the well. And he did the opposite. I mean, he just couldn't, couldn't have been better about the entire transition and the handoff. Anything I would have done differently? Not with regard to the transition between Reed and I, no. I remember having a chat with Reed uh, several years ago and he referred to you as a co-founder. Yeah. And uh, I thought it was like, uh, if you want the ultimate qualitative metric, <laughs> For where the transition went well, it was basically a transition between a co-founder to a co-founder mm. in many ways. Um, going a little bit deeper, when you joined, you were very determined on building a culture that embodies kind of how you felt, you know, the company should be run. Uh, culture has been in the news a lot recently, also because of Uber. It feels like everything is because of Uber recently in the news. But um, culture is one of those like magical almost things, but like you can actually by design, prepare for it, build it. Um, one thing I was wondering was, was when you came in with this kind of sense of purpose to bring to the company and culture, was that something that you saw at Yahoo done right and you wanted to bring this in? Or was it the opposite? It wasn't strong at Yahoo, so you feel that was kind of a weak, a weak parts. 
and he wanted to rebuild it at LinkedIn. Yeah. So uh, before I get to culture, just your point about Reed um, making the comment that he thought of me as a co-founder. The first time he ever said that, we were in an interview, a joint interview, and uh, the journalist asked Reed a question, and the ultimate answer was that he thought of me as a co-founder. It was the highest compliment I've ever been paid in my career by a wide margin. Uh, it blew me away. And uh, he, in part, had uh, been talking to Jack Dorsey, and Jack had said that uh, throughout the evolution of a company, there's really multiple founding moments. And that, that really resonated with Reed, and as he explained it to me, it really resonated with me. For those of you in the audience who are going to be on this arc or trajectory, it's a really good thing to keep in mind. Uh, oftentimes, when people are in situations where they're either handing the baton off to someone new to run the company or they're inheriting the company, uh, they're not necessarily thinking about it like that, that there's multiple founding moments that this person coming into the organization could be, and I think you have to earn that, but could be treated like a co-founder. And, and that, that sense of ownership and proprietorship uh, just makes, it kind of elevates the entire relationship. Uh, so I think, um, yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Seems so, like Satya is going for his founding moment right now as well. Yeah, I, you know, it'd be interesting to hear how Bill would characterize that. You know, both Bill and Steve were essentially co-founders, or if Bill was the founder with, um, uh, yeah, with uh, his team, Steve would have been a founding employee. And uh, Satya is certainly uh, leaving an indelible mark on Microsoft. And by virtue of having been there for over two decades, I think he also feels like it's part of part of him. Uh, so I think that's a, a big part of the success that he's having there. With regard to culture, so uh, when I first joined, uh, like a lot of folks, I didn't uh, put a lot of weight. I didn't think much of culture and values. Uh, had you asked me about it after my first few weeks at the company, I would have probably rolled my eyes at you and cited a Dilbert comic strip. And I think that was by virtue of having worked at companies where culture and values may have been something people talked about, but not necessarily walk the walk. And so it didn't have a lot of credibility with me. I didn't understand the power of it. But after a few months of being installed as CEO, I recognized that uh, increasingly a lot of people were approaching me and saying, so what's our culture going to be? What are LinkedIn's values? And so realized I, I should probably start to give that some thought. Interestingly enough, an exercise had, had begun right before I got there, uh, kind of a bottoms-up exercise to determine the culture and values of the company. And then uh, I had a conversation uh, with uh, a former colleague, very bright guy, and very, very, also very thoughtful like Reed, uh, younger. And he said, uh, Jeff, I think it's really important that we define our culture and values. And I said, why? More and more people are asking me about this. Why do you think it's so important? And he said, well, the company's growing so quickly, we're hiring from uh, these well-established companies, companies like Yahoo and eBay and Microsoft and Google. And he said, if we don't have a clearly codified set of values, if we don't have a clear understanding of who we are culturally, people are just going to bring their own experiences with them and whatever they've learned at those companies. And it could fracture. And I had never thought about it like that, but it made an awful lot of sense. And I said, you're right. So set about codifying it and that exercise that uh, kind of bottoms up exercise, uh, got more involved and uh, was very interested in what that team had to say. But at the end of the day, if the leadership doesn't feel like the values are of them, it's going to be far more challenging for an organization to really walk the walk. So uh, we kind of did these uh, parallel processes where there was a bottoms up tiger team and I did an exercise with my team, the leadership team. And it started with defining culture and defining values. Um, oftentimes they're used synonymously. I think that's a lost opportunity. Culture for us uh, is the collective personality of our organization. It's who we are and who we aspire to be. That aspirational component is absolutely essential uh, because it helps organizations avoid that situation. I was describing earlier, and one of the reasons I wasn't a big fan of culture and values is you'll get the leadership coming up on a stage like this at an all hands doing the big unveiling of the new culture and the new values. And people in the audience are like, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, we're, we're, no, we're none of those things. And that's the last time anyone will pay attention, no matter you know, how many laminated mouse cards uh, or wallet cards are distributed in mouse pads, and no matter who, you know, how many walls have it on there. Uh, if you're not walking the walk, it's just not going to mean anything to anybody. And so it's really important that the, the team owns it, and not only owns it, but it has an aspirational quality. It provides you more room 
to navigate. So you may not be manifesting what you're trying to accomplish every day in terms of your culture, but at least people know where you stand and what you're trying to accomplish. So that's super important. Uh, values are the first principles upon which an organization like LinkedIn makes day-to-day -day decisions. And we had five cultural dimensions, as Tomer well knows, and uh, we have six operating values. And we take those very, very seriously. And they're part of the fabric of the organization. We hire and recruit against it. We onboard against it. We develop our team against our culture and values. And we evaluate performance uh, with regard to our culture and values. At LinkedIn, it's not just a question of the what we're trying to accomplish, the mission, uh, the strategic objectives, the measurable goals. It's how we accomplish them. And over time, it became clear that just because someone is a superstar in terms of uh, the results that they're generating, if they're not doing so in a way that's consistent with our culture and values, if they're not reinforcing the culture and values, if they're not modeling the culture and values, uh, they're not going to last long at the company. I remember we went for an exercise where uh, Jeff asked every product head to do a vision to values of their product, uh, which goes to vision, mission, strategy, priorities, and values. And I think... Uh, I sent you like a hunger drafts, and uh, you know, words kind of, uh, in many ways, Jeff taught me the kind of the importance of words, and literally I think we had like an 11 p.m. back and forth on a word, which word will kind of fit better, and you know, I became, uh, that kind of opened a whole new muscle in me I wasn't aware of, but in many shapes and form, it became an exercise that everybody did, and everybody spent so much time into it, and then you kind of bottled it all together, and it kind of made sense, and in many shapes and forms, it kind of became how you would run meetings, Mm. and how you would talk about the metrics of your product and how you define success. Um, so that exercise by itself has been painful but uh, extremely rewarding. When, when you've talked about, you kind of touched on where we're going uh, globally, a hyper growth, that's where culture gets challenged. Um, Microsoft, different culture, different company. Uh, kind of how did you think about protecting it? So once you build something that you kind of thought this is exactly how I want my company to run, but now there's all these externalities that, you know, some I can control, some it's going to be very hard for me to control. How did you think about controlling that culture, you, protecting it? Before we get into protecting it, you mentioned global and uh, the ability to scale uh, and the ability to continue to manifest your culture and values. Not only the ability to continue to manifest it, but the importance of defining culture and values in terms of successfully scaling. I think a lot of companies go off the rails when they start to establish multiple offices because when you're in one office and you need to communicate things and you need to reinforce culture and values, you're all there together. As a matter of fact, uh, sometimes companies are in one room. And so you, know, you need to do an all hands and the, the founder will be like, all right, everyone can get your attention. And everyone looks up, that's an all hands. And it's a lot easier to reinforce culture and values and it's a lot easier for the, that leader uh, to make sure that people are all uh, working in the right uh, path and all aligned. When you start to establish multiple offices, when you start to scale beyond 15 or even 150 people, that's when it becomes absolutely critical, especially the people managing these remote locations, that the leadership is uh, really doing things in a way that's uh, consistent with the culture and values of the headquarters and the founders or the leadership. And uh, when they're hired because of the pace and the need to put butts in seats because folks are concerned about letting an opportunity go, and they are not espousing the same culture and values, and they are falling back on whatever comes most naturally to them, that's when companies can start to get into serious problems. They start to see real challenges, and you start to see real friction and tension. Uh, with regard to uh, the specific of, um, uh, that you were just asking about, uh, with regard to uh, culture, you had asked. Yeah, the Microsoft protecting it. And so when we first started with Microsoft, one of the keys to uh, deciding that we were going to do the acquisition to begin with was making sure we'd be able to operate in a way that was consistent with our culture and values. And all too often you see this in recruiting and you see this with regard to m and I think people get so caught up with closing the transaction. They get so caught up with their ego and the finish line that they lose sight of what's going to make the hire or the acquisition successful. And you, I always say when I'm sitting down with a candidate uh, for the first time or someone of the teams asked me to close, my, my first question is, what's, what's your dream job? And what I'm looking for there is not only whether or not this person has the awareness and understands what it is they ultimately want to accomplish, but does that fit in with the role that we're currently offering? 
And this fit should be evaluated in both directions. And the fit, a, a big part of that is culture. The same thing holds with companies. When you're looking to merge or acquire uh, another company, to the extent you're just trying to get the deal done, you're not thinking about how it's going to work afterwards, and you're not thinking about are these missions aligned, is the sense of purpose aligned, are the culture and the values aligned, it, it's going to have a uh, much lower likelihood for success. And oftentimes, you see a lot of M&A failing as a result of that. When Satya and I sat down for the first time, we said we, we shouldn't move forward unless we have agreement and alignment on at least two things. One was sense of purpose, and the other was structure. And structure, to some extent, is a proxy for the ability to continue to manifest our culture and values. With regard to purpose, uh, we were far more aligned than I think either one of us had realized going into that first meeting. Uh, our mission is to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive and successful. Uh, Microsoft is to empower every individual and organization on the planet to achieve more. So very similar sense of purpose. We've gone at it from a different direction. Uh, Microsoft has done it through historically software and increasingly the cloud, and LinkedIn has done it through a professional network. So we had a line we could check the box on the sense of purpose. And Satya is also a very purpose-driven individual, which was wonderful. Structure, uh, I didn't know what to expect. And he said, you know, I want to do this very differently. Uh, I, I want LinkedIn to be independent and continue to be autonomous and really use more of a, a YouTube, uh, WhatsApp, uh, Instagram, Oculus Rift approach to this. And uh, one of the reasons that was so important to me and to us at LinkedIn was that kind of autonomy would allow us to continue to do things in a way that was consistent with our culture and values. It also turned out, if you had asked me the most positive surprise or the biggest surprise period uh, over the six to nine month period before the close where we were getting to know one another and doing what we were calling learning days and spending time uh, with various teams, I was really surprised at how similar the, the culture was between the two companies. I was not expecting that in the least. And I don't think that necessarily would have been the case prior to Satya uh, being in charge of the company. Uh, but it turns out uh, we do things uh, very similarly. Microsoft exists at a different scale, and I think that's a really important variable. Uh, but the approach that Satya and the leadership team have taken there under Satya uh, and the way the company is running what they're trying to accomplish, uh, it, it, oftentimes it feels very familiar. So that has significantly contributed to what thus far has been a success. We have a long way to go. When, when we talk about values, I felt that one of our unwritten values at LinkedIn is compassionate leadership mm -hmm. that you've been advocating for. Um, and it's not written anywhere. We have our you know, written values across and remember first and demand excellence and we, we stay true to those. There's kind of one additional one we haven't kind of written in them. It's not on any uh, posters, but it's something that I think you kind of instill to the group. Um, and to give you guys an example, which is you know, a personal example, um, I don't know if Jeff remembers this, but several years ago, my team had a big review with Jeff. We practiced like crazy. Uh, we, you know, we crossed all our T's out of all the I's. We came, the material was like spotless. We were ready, and we couldn't get past the first fucking page. And Are you allowed to say the F-bomb on stage here uh, yeah. at the uh, event? You just mean? Good? Adam just uh, shrugged his shoulders. That's okay. Um, I, literally, we couldn't get the fast, you know, past the first page, and I, I left very frustrated. Um, I had a negative energy. I went to Jeff's office, and I said, hey, can we, can we talk? And Jeff immediately said, let's go for a walk. And I think we went on a very long walk because the sun was coming down as we were coming, coming back from the walk. And you helped me unframe. We were kind of spectators to that meeting, the motivations of the people in the room, the understanding of the material. Uh, and I came back, I remember, super energetic. It was just night and day how I felt <clears throat> before and after. And then I kind of rallied the team around it and so on. But that was, for me, an amazing, amazing compassionate leadership moment. Um, so one I was wondering, first, if you can explain to the crowd what is compassionate leadership for you, because I'm guessing there's a lot of interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. And two, uh, you know, you describe yourself, you were a very strong IC back in the Warner, Bro you know, the Warner Brothers days, uh, and then you became an operating uh, uh, executive VP, and then you talked about your growth with compassionate leadership. So I was wondering kind of how did that growth happen, and then what's the kind of you know, how does that help you do your job better today? So when... Uh, did, you, did you recall that case? By yeah, uh, it was a long walk. Yeah. Uh, a lot of laps around the building, our old campus in Mountain View, and you were not happy when we started, but you were a lot happier by the end of it. 
So, uh, so let's start with the definition of compassion, at least uh, the definition of compassion that I like to use within a, a work environment. So it's putting yourself in the shoes of another person, seeing the world through their lens or perspective, and then classically defined as for the purpose of alleviating their suffering. But in a work environment, I like to think of it more broadly as just helping them, helping them to achieve an objective, helping them to achieve shared objectives with you. Not to be confused with empathy, which in Western society, empathy and compassion are typically used synonymously. And I know I couldn't have told you the difference between these two words up until I was about 30, 31, and I read The Art of Happiness, which is the teachings of the Dalai Lama. Empathy is feeling what another living thing feels. And all too often, people aspire to empathy without recognizing the unintended consequences can sometimes be destructive rather than constructive. Uh, so to give you an example, it's not my example, it's the Dalai Lama's example. If you were uh, walking along a mountainous trail and you came across somebody who was suffocating with a boulder that had fallen on their chest, the empathetic response is to feel the same sense of suffocation, which would render you helpless. You wouldn't be able to do anything if you were truly suffocating. The compassionate response is to recognize that that person can't breathe, perhaps draw upon your own experiences and leverage a moment of empathy where you realize how painful that must be, how uncomfortable that is, and then do everything within your power to alleviate their suffering by removing the boulder. The difference between empathy and compassion. Another way of thinking about it, compassion is a more objective form of empathy. It enables you to maintain a little bit of space and distance between you and the other person so you can act upon your emotions. When Tomer and I first went out for the walk and we had just left this meeting, uh, he was all emotion. And it would have been very easy for me, and had we rewound the clock 10 years, he would have been angry, I would have been defensive, and we would have gotten nowhere. Uh, but what I've learned over time is that if I can get out of my own head, if I can become a spectator to my own thoughts, especially when I become emotional, and I was probably feeling some emotion because he was pretty agitated, he's an intense dude, I'm an intense dude. I was thinking to myself, I wonder why he's so upset. And knowing Tomer and having worked with him for some period of time prior to that, I had a sense why he was upset. And I was putting myself in his shoes and I understood how I could have been upset too, but I thought he was missing the broader picture. And so I started to explain to him how I would have done things a little differently if I were him and maybe this is why he reacted a certain way. And slowly but surely, as Tomer recognized I was trying to help him and not criticize him and certainly not tear him down, he lost the anger, he lost any kind of defensive posture and you can literally, when you're with someone during a time like this, you can see the body language change. You can feel the energy change. And it goes from being one of an incredibly defensive posture to being completely open to the feedback. And that's where you create the most value. So you think about work. You think about any people who have to work together, interact on any kind of regular basis, and think about how fraught with conflict and tension that naturally is going to be. Uh, we experience tension every day. And by the way, tension can be a very good thing. It can be constructive. Too much tension, not so much. But tension, conflict, they can be good things in terms of value creation. And all too often, when we experience this kind of tension, we immediately knee-jerk uh, to anger or assuming some kind of nefarious intention on the part of the person we're interacting with. Uh, they must be out to get me. Uh, they're being territorial. This is all about politics. Uh, they must be ignorant. Um, whatever. And all too often, we don't take a step back and think to ourselves, I wonder why this person is reacting the way that they are. Sometimes it literally could be as simple as they're having a bad day. It's got nothing to do with you or the conversation you're having. But it could run deeper than that. And again, it may not be triggered by you specifically. They may be going back to a previous experience they have, and this is drudging up bad memories. And you just push that button in them. They may be dealing with stuff outside of work, heavy stuff that if you were more aware of, you would have approached things differently. There is an endless list of things that could be behind the emotion. If you can take a step back, if you can start to think about where they're coming from, what they're experiencing, you can forge a much stronger connection like Tomer and I did that day. And those connections, those become the building blocks upon which trust is built. You build shorthand, you know the other person's looking out for you, and that you're in this together. And when you multiply that across hundreds, if not thousands of people, we have 11,000 people at LinkedIn, and I'm fairly certain the vast, vast majority of them could not only explain to you what compassion is, they could provide you an example of how they're managing compassionately, or at least aspiring to manage compassionately every day.
at the company. So it has been uh, wonderfully powerful. And uh, I guess the only other thing I would add on this is uh, I, I, to your point, I was not always compassionate. Uh, like a lot of younger executives who were thrust into positions with a lot of responsibility without uh, much prior experience, I just assumed other people should do things the way I did them. And that, to a large extent, is human nature. Uh, it's an egocentric view of the world. And egocentrism is very natural. It actually helps us survive. We see the world through our own perspective, and that helps us navigate a lot of different viscera and a lot of different stimulus that come at us every, every day. And what I didn't realize was that by virtue of projecting the way I did things on other people and expecting them to do things the way I did, I wasn't playing to their strengths. And that can create a lot of tension in and of itself. And that creates a lot of vicious cycles. And when you can get out of that dynamic and start thinking about the person and what motivates them and what they're trying to accomplish and what they're best at and the things that they need to improve upon to accomplish whatever it is you're trying to accomplish together, then you can coach them in those areas, play to their strengths, generate more confidence, again, work together. And uh, you know, I experienced a, a moment that's probably going on 12, 13, 14 years where I was actually giving some advice, it turns out, to my manager who I thought was undermining uh, one of my peers during uh, our manager's staff meetings. And I said, the next time you feel like expressing anger or frustration to that person, you should go find a mirror and do it to yourself because you're responsible for them being in the role. And if you don't like the job that they're doing, you should be constructively talking to them about how they could be doing a more effective job. And if you don't think they're up to the task, you should think about another role for them at the company or maybe transition them out in a constructive way. And he stopped and he said, let me think about this. And two weeks later, we had another one-on-one. -on -one. He said, I have to tell you, uh, that was really, really valuable advice. Thank you so much. I've taken it. It's changed my relationship with this person. I'm going to start doing that with other people. And as he was saying this, I realized I was doing the exact same thing with someone on my team. I mean, the exact same thing. And in that moment, I vowed that as long as I would be responsible for other people, I would aspire to manage compassionately. You talk about compassion being taught at schools hmm. as part of the curriculum. Yeah. I... I can't think of anything, especially in this day and age, I can't think of anything more important than teaching kids compassion. You know, we talk about math and reading and writing and all the basics, and it almost feels like compassion should be the underlying foundation or operating system upon which all this learning is taking place. And compassion can be taught. I didn't realize that, uh, but compassion can be taught. And uh, I stumbled across a, a documentary, uh, PBS Frontline uh, documentary called A Class Divided one night years and years ago. I was traveling on business and I was in my hotel. I couldn't sleep. I turned the television on. I was flipping through the channels. And all of a sudden, I came across this documentary of this uh, teacher uh, in the Midwest, white teacher, all white classroom, uh, elementary school. And the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, she decided she needed to do something about it. And so she divided the kids up, light eyes and dark eyes. And on the first day of this two-day exercise, she told the light-eyed kids how smart they were and how much better they were than the dark-eyed kids and gave them all the privileges and let them go to the water fountain first and go to the bathroom first and made the dark-eyed kids kind of do stuff for the light-eyed kids. And you could see the light-eyed kids getting all full of themselves and believing everything she was saying. And the dark-eyed kids really started to get down on themselves and lose their sense of self-esteem. And the magic of this exercise was on day two when she flipped it. She said, I'm sorry, I made a horrible mistake. It's not the light-eyed kids who are better. It's the dark-eyed kids. And so you could see, interestingly enough, the dark-eyed kids treated the light-eyed kids a lot better because they had just been treated like shit the day before. But what really got interesting was this documentary uh, stayed with these kids for the next 10, 15, like 20 years. And almost to a person, every one of these kids was a member of the civil rights movement. So you realize that, I mean, that's one exercise. There are countless exercises. But uh, I'm on the site council of my daughter's elementary school. And uh, we have an extraordinary uh, principal who's very open-minded and entrepreneurial and wants to try different things and take risks. And she's been very interested in uh, working with me and working with some others on... Uh, making compassion a part of the curriculum. So uh, I always told her that if we could get this right at our particular school, I would be interested in providing the resources to try to scale it nationally. 
so we haven't announced it publicly yet, but uh, working with a company called EverFi uh, that reaches about 28,000 schools in the United States, and they do some really interesting social emotional learning materials and really innovative approach. And uh, we're working, working on a compassion program based on some of the stuff that we know already works at our public school. Folks in our familiar education is one of Jeff's biggest passions long before Yahoo, maybe even college days. I don't know if that's true. Yeah, it was uh, in high school and I decided I wanted to help uh, with education in some way. And it feels today education reform is more important than ever. Mm. AI, robotics, automation of jobs, job disappearing in the tens of thousands in countries, uh, kind of an unforeseen future for kids. Um, you know, there's a whole notion around uh, the skills gap that we've, you know, you've been uh, a big um, uh, thought leader in the space around how can LinkedIn close the skills gap. Uh, there's the focus around building skills rather than just focusing on degrees. Mm. I was wondering, kind of thinking, starting with the children aspect, um, 10 years from now, if your daughter told you that she has offers from Harvard, Stanford, and Penn, Jeff is a Penn uh, graduate, um, but she really wants to take online courses instead, would you be supportive? Yeah, I'd be supportive, but not necessarily for the reason you're asking uh, and trying to get into probably a skills versus degrees debate, Tomer. Very clever. Uh, I'd be supportive. Uh, this has nothing to do with me being at LinkedIn or, or being an executive. I'd be supportive because my wife and I have spent a lot of time talking about it. And having lived in Silicon Valley now for, God, it's coming up on 15, 17 years, uh, there's... Uh, a lot of incredibly talented people here uh, who work very hard, uh, creating a better life for their kids and a better, a better world. But the unintended consequence of all of this overachievement is a lot of kids feeling a lot of pressure, and that sometimes has disastrous consequences. And uh, we have just decided our, it's gonna sound so kind of new agey, but our primary objective with our kids is not where they go to school, it's them being happy. And I don't mean happy like on a Hallmark card. I mean equipped to be happy and productive and conscientious and mindful and grateful uh, and philanthropic in their lives. So if our kids decide that the best way to pursue that path is by taking online courses, so be it. Uh, for those that think I'm full of it, we, we can circle back in 10 years' time and we'll see uh, how they're doing. Uh, but th they're not going to feel, and I, I didn't feel uh, pressure, explicit pressure from my parents. As a matter of fact, I, I think I just created the pressure for myself. I knew where I wanted to go to school. I knew what I wanted to do. So I guess in that respect, my parents, uh, it, was, it was a little easier for them on, you know, on that avenue, down that avenue. But the girls can go wherever they think is best for them. We had a shocking moment this year, just a few, week, a few weeks ago. My daughter... Uh, went to kinder in Palo Alto, and on the first day of school, there was an announcement from the district that a kid committed suicide mm -hmm. in Gun High. So it really, re really resonated with that, that point. Um, I want to make sure we leave time for one or two questions. So if folks want to... One or two? Break, You're one, so generous, Tom. Yeah, well, you have more time? Folks yeah, would love to spend more time. Uh, so if folks want to... I have a lot of more questions. You get one question. Yeah. That's it. Make it a good one. Talk amongst yeah. yourselves. Just to make sure it's an amazing question, but uh, that's, that's the, the bar. Hi, Jeff. My name is Varvara. Um, Are you filming my answer to your question? I am. I am. Um, <laughs> the modern age. Yeah, that's the way. Um, my question to you, I'm actually very grateful to your lecture several years ago at Stanford on Compassion. Oh, that yeah. James made Doty. Me, yeah. yeah that I started meditating and it changed my life. Oh, great. So um, that's why I was so curious and um, interested in sharing it with um, as many people as I can. So my question to you is looking backwards um, and if you were able to talk to yourself when you were 15, 20, 30, what, would you, what, what type of advice would you give to yourself? Those different Did you say 15, 20, and 30? Yeah. Was that used in conjunction with one another, like my younger <laughs> self, or you want three answers? Three answers, actually. <laughs> By the way, rule of thumb for any of you doing public speaking, anytime you're asked a question and you ask for a modification of the question, if you do multiple parts, they're going to say yes. So then you have to answer everything that you just said, and I Thank you. forgot the rules. So Okay, so 15, 20, and 30. <laughs> Holy smokes. 15, 20, and 30. 15, you're in New York? Yeah, 15. 
uh, try not to be so serious. My dad used to tell me that all the time. And I used to be like, Dad, come on. <laughs> it's like, he's telling me not to be serious. And I'd be like so serious in my answer to him. Uh, I was, I was, I was re really serious at a young age. Uh, I was, I've been intense for most of my life. And I think that manifested itself at 15. Uh, I could certainly be social and extroverted, but I was also very, very introspective and probably overthought a bunch of stuff. I, this is probably something that a lot of kids do, but uh, if I could give advice to myself at 15, it would be relax, enjoy, uh, you know, don't, don't worry, uh, be yourself, stuff like that. I'm looking at you, I should be looking at her and her camera. Uh, at 20, I don't think it would have been uh, particularly uh, materially different. I think it probably would have been uh, somewhat similar. If I uh, was just on the verge of graduation, uh, 21 and change, uh, and I was looking for career advice, I would give myself three pieces of advice. Uh, I would remind myself of the importance of knowing what it is I ultimately want to accomplish. I say remind myself because uh, my dad, who I just mentioned, is telling me to lighten up a little bit. Also, when I was uh, really little, every night before I used to go to bed, my dad would say I could do anything I set my mind to. Every night. And he said it so often, it used to go in one ear and out the other. And uh, I thought it was just like a, a bromide that every parent told their kids, like, eat your vegetables. And I didn't realize until much, much later in my life uh, how deeply... Uh, that had really resonated and how much uh, of who I am today is as a result of believing that. Uh, I later went back and I asked my dad, did you just say that because you thought it was good parenting or what? Don't, you know, did you hear that from your dad? He said, no, no, I certainly didn't hear it from my dad and I told you that because I thought it was true. So that really meant a lot. So that's the, the first piece of advice not only I would give myself but anyone graduating school today and even people who have started to embark on their career path. It's the importance of knowing what it is you ultimately want to accomplish because it's then that you start to manifest it in both explicit and implicit ways. And I don't believe in predeterminism. and I don't believe it's fatalistic. Uh, I do believe, though, if you have a sense of what it is you want to accomplish, optimizing for both passion and skills and not one at the exclusion of the other. And we're not talking about pipe dreams here. Um, we're talking about grounding this, uh, but I think that's how you begin to make it happen. Second piece of advice would be to surround myself with only the best people I could find and not just focus on who I'm reporting to. And I used to think it was about you know, who I'd hitch my wagon to, a boss, a mentor, someone that would be there for me, provide great sage advice and allow me to fail and pick me back up and so forth and so on, provide opportunities. But in this day and age, as the world becomes more networked and more digital, more connected, it's about people all the way around. It's the people you report to, the people that you work with, the people that report to you. And I would tell myself to have a sense of the kinds of people I would want to work with. Uh, and for me today, uh, I've given that a lot of thought and can summarize it as people that dream big, get shit done, and know how to have fun, and not to compromise on any of those. Look for people right in the sweet spot of that Venn diagram. And the third thing I would tell my 20-year-old self is uh, that I should always be learning that the world is changing so quickly and there's so much coming at us that uh, the, the days where you could learn one thing and be set up for success or a trade the rest of your life, I think those are quickly coming to an end. And I think those people that are naturally intellectually curious about the world around them just love learning new things and have steep learning curves, uh, they're going to be in a really strong position. So I would have told myself to always be learning. And then 30, it would have been to be compassionate, which we kind of already talked about. Sure. There was a question I got before. Um, it was, uh, if I'm a startup, and I don't... If you were a startup, what startup would you be? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What kind of animal would you be? Um, <laughs> and I don't want LinkedIn chasing after me because I'm doing something in LinkedIn space. Mm -hmm. What are the safe zones within professional network that I should basically kind of focus on? So I know LinkedIn is not going to be there anytime soon. I don't know. We have a pretty ambitious roadmap, <laughs> as you're we aware. Uh, you know, 
I think the, the learning space is gigantic. And, and though we acquire Linda and are focused on uh, learning and development, uh, there are so many opportunities there. It's such a huge marketplace. It's so massively fragmented, still highly antiquated. I think there's plenty of room for different approaches there. That would be the first thing that comes to mind. Cool. Uh, one last question. Um, anyone, we, anyone else? Yeah. In, uh, here we here go. go. Yeah, so... Uh, I guess it, part of that is also just if, you know, you're just amongst uh, your Israeli friends, if you can candidly share any thoughts around uh, weaknesses that you see um, in LinkedIn. <laughs> we, we are very uh, direct. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, in terms of facilitating nodes, I think uh, one of the... The key learnings for us as an organization is recognition of the differences between following and connecting. Uh, historically, we were about connecting people, and that created um, a lot of value in terms of building out these networks. It also had unintended consequences of people starting to see content being shared by connections who they had zero interest in following. Just because I put you in my Rolodex, just because we exchange business cards, doesn't mean I'm interested in what articles you're reading. And so context matters with regard to these nodes in a very big way. So now uh, we have a much clearer delineation between when it makes sense for someone to be connected and when it makes sense to suggest someone should follow another person or another organization. Uh, once you are connected, once you're following uh, the right nodes uh, in this parlance, uh, and the content liquidity starts to reach uh, some kind of critical mass so that you're seeing enough content in your feed and that content is of a high enough quality, that's when we start to see greater engagement. And that engagement then prompts people to want to connect and follow other nodes. And uh, they'll, they will become connected and be followed by other folks. And this all just kind of builds on itself. The, the real accelerant uh, to these nodes being generated and forged uh, in the modern era where we see, you know, at this point for LinkedIn, roughly 70% of our engagement happening through mobile is notifications, and in particular, push notifications. So once there is um, some uh, behavior on the site uh, that we think is worthy of your attention, um, sending out the right push notification at the right time, recognizing when it's too, too much, uh, when it's not enough, uh, and bringing you back in to get more heavily engaged and then prompting further connections, uh, that's a big part of that process that you were just describing. And the team's become quite adept at this, um, most recently uh, understanding the power of this ecosystem dynamic. So we're starting to see some real gains in terms of engagement, which has been a lot of fun to see. In terms of uh, LinkedIn's weaknesses, uh, this kind of dovetails with your first question, because while historically it's been a real weakness, we're starting to see real traction. And that is that of the 500 plus million people who've signed up for LinkedIn, the vast majority don't still understand how to get value from LinkedIn. And that's solely on us to make it easier, to make it more intuitive, to make it more seamless, uh, and to give them reasons to want to make the effort to learn more about LinkedIn. Uh, what we've started to see uh, since um, I wouldn't say nailing that ecosystem dynamic I was just describing, but certainly getting that flywheel spinning in a, in a faster way than ever before, is that for the people that already understood or got value from LinkedIn, people that were already visiting us are starting to visit us much, much more, which is wonderful to see. And it's a lot of fun because this is the reason we do what we do. And uh, we've seen it uh, in terms of the results and the numbers and the growth of sessions and what we call an engaged quality member. Uh, we've seen it in terms of engaged feed sessions, which Tomer and team were uh, highly responsible for uh, creating the most engaging feed experience that we possibly could. Um, so th there's a lot of good traction there, but uh, we're still only reaching a small percentage of the total number of people who've signed up in the way we want to reach them. So uh, the challenge right now is in 
uh, reaching out to those folks who signed up and may not use us or may not have frequented the site uh, since it's really started to generate a much higher quality content and a higher quality experience and uh, ensure that they're also finding value in LinkedIn. And when we can do that um, for all the momentum that we're seeing, that takes us to an entirely different level. I would add two other things. Uh, I was just focused uh, more on the content and those connections between people or the following relationships. If you want to get people engaged with a website on a daily basis, there's essentially two uh, pursuits, two dimensions. One is content, the other is communications. And our inbox uh, was growing highly antiquated. Uh, it hadn't really been touched for the better part of a decade, and that's no exaggeration. And uh, we finally embraced uh, the modern era of uh, digital communications in terms of messaging. And uh, we saw explosive growth there uh, in terms of uh, the, way in the way in which people were reaching out to one another, connecting, communicating, et cetera. And at the end of the day, that's what we do. So it's, you look back on it, it's like, how could this have taken us so long? Uh, so that's been great to see. Uh, and then lastly, it's really interesting because uh, if I were to ask all of you to describe LinkedIn, what's the first few words that would come to mind? If you had to describe LinkedIn and so on, how would you describe us, a professional network? So we always thought about it as a network. Uh, Reed founded it as a, a mechanism. Reed and Alan Blue, his co-founder, founded it as a mechanism to facilitate professional networking and take these offline relationships that Reed had forged and uh, bring them online and, and scale them and so forth and so on and change the way people worked. So networking has always been uh, a core part of what it is that we do. But if you think about it, uh, networking in these nodes is not enough. It's actually what people do with the connections, what people do with their network. And the more we can forge a true sense of community, not just a network, but a community, a place people go to help and be helped with whatever it is that they're trying to accomplish in a professional context, that's a game changer. And what we're seeing as we begin to embrace this, and it may sound like just a semantic issue, but as Tomer alluded to earlier, I believe strongly words have power and they change behavior. And as the team increasingly starts to embrace this idea of LinkedIn as a professional community, not just a professional network, we're starting to see a change in the way our members are relating to one another and the way we develop these products and services and the way we market the products and services. And it's just been so gratifying to be on the receiving end of outreach from our members talking about their recognition of this change and how much value they're getting from the service and thanking us and their gratitude. And then, of course, seeing it in the numbers and it's been wonderful, but it's still very early days there. Just today I got over the break of at least I think a dozen like, oh, I, you know, I started coming to LinkedIn Daily. I'm not actually sure why, but I think it's kind of like that intuitiveness is starting to build into the product. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, thank you very much for joining us. If you guys, if you guys seen LinkedIn, it's a fascinating case study, uh, not only in terms of the strength of the network, the business model, uh, but also in terms of the leadership. I think this goes back to the first question around this has really been a transition between a co-founder and a co-founder, which made this company so successful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me.